Tammy and John slumped back into their chairs in defeat. Joey, their 29-year-old son, had just left to go home. They had a wonderful dinner, but it ended on a sour note. They remembered spending a lot of time at church with him when he was younger and making sacrifices to take him to youth group activities and trying their best to read the Bible and pray with him in their home as he was growing up. And now they're sorrowful because they aren't, they aren't sure he still believes. He doesn't go to church. They think he believes in a God, but they're not quite sure. And any time they try to talk to him about it, at best he doesn't seem interested or at worst, he gets upset and ends the conversation. Does this sound familiar to any of you? Or perhaps you can replace the characters in that example with a sibling, or a dear friend, or even a spouse. Someone whom you care for deeply, who you know has heard God's Word. You know they've heard it from you, and they've heard it from others, but you feel like no change is happening, nothing's going on. No progress is being made. Well, you're not alone. It turns out that that feeling of powerlessness isn't personal to you. It's, in fact, part of our human condition. And our gospel text this morning touches on this aspect of the Christian life and provides some comfort for those of the faith who are struggling to deal with the realities of their witness about Jesus not always working the way they'd like or in the time frame that they would prefer. Welcome to the life of what we will call the mysterious middle, that time between the planting of the seed of God's Word and the harvest, where God is establishing His kingdom in Jesus, but not in a lot of ways that we understand or recognize. Or to put it another way, if we were choosing how things would go, this is not the way we would have chosen. So this mysterious middle we find ourselves in is highlighted in our text in the two parables, the last two of five that Jesus gives in the book of Mark in chapter 4, and they highlight the mystery of God's kingdom that is established in Jesus with a couple of different focuses, and for our purposes Today, we're going to look at the first one, the parable of the seed growing, in verses 26 to 29. So let me do a short recap of the parable. It is said to be describing all of these parables that Jesus is teaching are describing what the kingdom of God is like. So there already is a key for us in understanding that perhaps what follows, we're not going to fully understand. It isn't our kingdom, it's God's. And it's a new kingdom that he's bringing about through his son. So not only is it beyond our ability to understand, but it's also new. So a man is scattering seed. And very quickly we move from the action of the man to the mysterious part of this short parable. Next it says, after the seed has been scattered... He sleeps and rises night and day. In other words, day in and day out, he goes about his business. And the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And then the time of harvest comes, and the man comes with the sickle. Now, the man in this parable is Jesus. He is the one establishing the kingdom of God by the spreading of his word, the scattering of the seed of the word of God. And then, of course, he is the one that comes in judgment at the time of harvest. But what perhaps might be confusing is his role in the middle part, where it seems that even Jesus, the man scattering the seed, doesn't understand all of how it works. That's the human nature of Jesus. And that God, the Father, is at work even while Jesus on earth sleeps. Now, at first you might be thinking, 
that that's not much comfort, given the example I gave you at the start. But bear with me for a little longer. You see, we're focusing on this middle part today, the part between the planting and the harvesting, because it's the part that we struggle with the most, because it's the part that we don't really do anything for. God uses us to help plant the seed. That's the very purpose of the church, the very reason that pastors are called to preach and administer the sacraments. All of that runs through the Word of God, which is taking root in your hearts and growing up into a vibrant faith. For those who do not yet believe the Word is planted in order to begin faith as a gift of God, and for those who already do believe, it sustains their faith in God. But at that point, our part ends. Even as I speak to you now, I have no control over what goes on inside your mind once you hear the words that I am speaking. And you may have heard me give an example in Bible class of times where people have credited me with saying brilliant things that I have no recollection of saying during the sermon because the Holy Spirit is at work. Because the Holy Spirit knows far more about you and your circumstances as you sit here today than I ever will. He knows what you need to hear. Now I can assure you that as a pastor, that promise is a great comfort to me. Because the efficacy of what I do as a pastor doesn't rely on me, but on him. And if you're wise, like the young children were this morning, if I ask you if you want me to get something done for you or God, I'm telling you now the answer should be God. But the planting is the job that the church has been empowered to do. So we get that part. It's that he sleeps and rises night and day and the the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how that we struggle with. The man who planted the seed doesn't know how it grows or even helps it grow. It's happening while he's sleeping. Yet, it grows. So the human character who does the planting lives his day, daily life, rising and, and going to sleep day in and day out, not knowing how the seed grows. So what this parable is teaching us is it's letting us know that in this new kingdom of God, there are times when we are in a mysterious middle, a time where we can't see or understand the work of God, but that it's also clear that God is at work all the time throughout this mysterious middle. Maybe you're in the thick of this right now. Maybe that example I started off the sermon with hit you pretty hard. Or maybe you're thinking about a worry for the future, feeling like That same sense of powerlessness when you imagine your own children 20 years from now. Or even your spouse or yourself 20 years from now and what little control you have of where those things go. A child baptized and raised in the church that has walked away from the faith. Or at the very least, you aren't sure about their faith. A spouse who has heard the gospel from you and others and still doesn't seem to believe. A dear friend who has heard but also doesn't believe. I've had conversations with some of you. I know this keeps you up, that it's a worry in your heart and in your mind because you're afraid. You're afraid of the powerlessness you feel when you think about such things. It's sort of like the weather. It is going to be what it's going to be without your say-so. We even have this fear about the church as a whole, thinking about where it'll be 30 years from now in our society that seems to have turned against it. Well, we've got to do something. We've got to fix something. We've got to come up with a plan to save the church. Spoiler alert, that's already been done. But I think this text and these parables will help us deal with this time that we live in the mysterious middle where we're frustrated about the lack of 
power that we have to influence things or even understand them at times. I think it helps in two ways. The first way is that it shows what the actual nature of the kingdom of God is. It tells us that there are times when God's work is hidden from us and mysterious. The feeling that that not knowing isn't some kind of defect or failure on your part. It isn't because you aren't doing enough. It's not because you failed at teaching the faith to your child or that you aren't witnessing enough to your friend or your spouse or whoever it is that you have inserted there. But that it's because the growing of the seed isn't your work. You go to sleep and rise each day and the work is being done without your aid or knowledge. Now, you might be thinking, that's not very comforting, Pastor. How does that help me? Doesn't that just make it worse? Confirming my worst fears that I can't do anything about this? At first, maybe. But I think that it's simply bad at the beginning because you're still holding on to the idea of the old kingdom, that the growth is your work. And then when God reveals this truth to you, that idea needs to go away, which is painful. But this parable helps us put that idea to rest. And once it is at rest, then we can see the comfort here. I'll illustrate that comfort with a question. Whoever came to your mind in the example I gave at the beginning of the sermon, I want you to recall them again, whether it's a child or a spouse or a dear friend. And I'm going to ask you one question. Who would you rather be responsible for the work of growing the seed of God's Word in their heart? You, the best person you know, or God? The parable makes the answer to this question clear. Now, the second way that the parable brings us comfort is that it helps to teach us that God is always working day in and day out amid this mysterious time. So not only is the task his job, but he is tireless in pursuing it. When you lay down your head at night to rest from the labors of the day, God does not rest. He is constantly searching and seeking and recalling the lost unto himself. This is the message that has been going out into the world ever since God established his kingdom in Jesus. And if we're being honest, if we really think about this kingdom established in Jesus, from the very beginning it has not gone the way that we would have expected or even hoped, at least initially. The second parable, which we're not really going to focus on too much today, highlights this aspect of the mysterious nature of the kingdom of God. Its beginnings are almost smaller than anything else you can choose. Yet it's far more effective than any uh, enterprise that we undertake. Because while that mustard seed is the smallest of all plants as a seed, it grows into the largest plant in the garden. Life in the mysterious middle can be hard lying down and rising each day, not knowing how God's work is done, also not being an active participant beyond the planting. Yet this parable teaches us that our powerlessness is actually good news. It's good news because someone far more capable, far more loving and tireless is at work on your behalf and on theirs. It means that the people you are concerned about, they don't rest in your hands. They are in God's, and he is at work day in and day out, sending out his word. It means that God's kingdom, which doesn't impress the way a human kingdom does, is the best and most effective way. Now, you may be wondering, just from a standpoint of human perspectives, whether there's any evidence of this. And I was sort of thinking about this as I was preparing the sermon, and I thought about the trajectory of Christianity throughout history is quite amazing. 
What began as a fringe sect of Judaism following a man named Jesus, born in a stable and grew up in a town so insignificant that even one of his future disciples said, can anything good come from Nazareth, is sent out. He calls 12 men, none of which are of much consequence. They're not scholars and and advisors to kings, but fishermen and tax collectors. The early church was persecuted and rejected. Many were put to death for the name of Jesus, and yet, in a few centuries, it became the recognized religion of the most powerful kingdom on earth. In a few more centuries, it began to serve as the foundation for the most influential culture and society the world has ever seen, the West, which continues even to this very day. So even from the standpoint of just our human reason, at least when we look in the past, we can see the evidence of the grandeur of God. How did all of that take place? Because day in and day out, God is working. The seed sprouts and grows, even though we often don't know how. I'll close with one one last comforting word from God in Isaiah 55. The teachings here of Jesus in his parable, the images he uses, echo the images from Isaiah 55. And the mystery is present there. And you've probably heard both of these two verse sections, but you've probably rarely heard them put together because they occur one after another. We have the mystery in verses 8 and 9 of Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Right? God is at work, and we can't understand it or see it. And then we have the comforting promise in the next two verses, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Dear friends in Christ, we may not understand how, but God is at work, growing the seed of his word and the task that he has sent it for as nothing less than the salvation of all people. So be comforted by his promise that his word has gone out. It has been established in Jesus, and he says to you that it shall accomplish that which he purposes and shall succeed for the thing in which he sent it. In the name of Jesus, amen.